Biomechanical Engineering Research Seminar, and this week we have a, a visitor from off campus. So this is Ms. Sonia Dick, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, and she's going to talk about lasers and uh, magma. And yeah. <laughs> um, so she is not a stranger to Rapid City, though. She grew up here and went to Stevens. Stevens, okay, and then went to Cal Poly. Um, uh, and did her undergraduate there in Cal Poly. In some, some uh, degree is similar to us of being applied nature and hands-on project-based learning. Like. Yeah. So welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, yeah, so today my talk might sound kind of physics-y, but I'll try to root it back in engineering principles because at heart I am a mechanical engineer. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about the research I've been doing during my PhD. Um, I'm in my fifth year now, and we're using laser-driven shocks to probe material viscosity at high pressures. So first, I'll just give a quick outline. Um, I'm going to talk about a field called high energy density physics, so we'll start with that, and then we'll kind of give some motivation and move on from there. So this regime of high energy density physics refers to materials at extremely high pressures. So energy density is just pressure. Um, and so this is the regime of materials that are above a pressure of one megabar, which is a million atmospheres, a million times atmospheric pressure. And so just for some grounding, I have um, some pressures or values of pressure here. So the yield strength of stainless steel was in like the thousands to ten thousands atm. The pressure in the bottom, deepest part of the ocean is a thousand atm. Uh, the pressure in Earth's core, which is now entering this high energy density physics regime, is 3.6 million atm. And then we go up from there to pressure the sun's core, 265 billion atm, or pressure in fusion experiments happening here on Earth is actually a little bit higher than that, maybe like 300 billion atm. So it's a very interesting regime to be in, very interesting physics, and very interesting engineering that you have to do to be able to probe these spaces. Um, looking at this graph, you can see that within this high energy density regime, we have things like um, fusion in the sun is in this high energy density regime, planetary interiors are in this regime, and then at the very top there we have something called ignition, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But I just kind of want to highlight um, this as we go down in pressure, that it, these are these materials, um, as we are at the high pressure, high temperature up there by the fusion, we treat them like fluids, they behave like fluids. Um, if they're fully ionized plasmas, then you can treat them like an ideal gas with some additional considerations of things like magnetic fields and fun stuff like that. As we go down, um, it gets a little bit harder to actually understand them to some extent. So partially ionized plasmas have very interesting equation of states, not necessarily an ideal gas. Then there's a regime called warm dense matter, which is essentially an ionized liquid state. Um, and then you get down into what we call the condensed matter regime, so still very high pressure, high temperature, but more of a solid. So very interesting um, things to explore here. But I'd say one of the main drivers of this field right now is inertial confinement fusion. So inertial confinement fusion is us trying to make some like conditions here on Earth, so causing a fusion reaction to get more energy out of the fuel capsule than we put into it. Um, a schematic of that is shown here on the left, and essentially lasers um, irradiate this can that this little pellet is held in, and that can cause a collapse of the pellet, which I'll explain a little bit more. But what's really exciting about this field, and which is driving a lot of motivation for a ton of different um, areas, is that just about almost a year ago, um, the place that does these implosions um, reached ignition for the first time, which means they got more energy out of this fuel pellet than they put into it. Um, not on an engineering stance, so they still didn't get more out than they put into their capacitor bank to make these lasers and stuff, but the energy incident on the fuel, um, they got more out due to this fusion explosion or implosion. So that is very exciting. You can see on this graph here, they've been trying to do that since this um, laser facility was built in around 2010, and just in the last few years, it's really exploded in the things that they can do. So there's a lot of interest. Um, you might be asking, why are we interested in fusion? There are national security purposes why we're interested in fusion, but especially now that we've showed that we can reach ignition, um, private companies are very interested in using fusion as a clean energy source. 
So that's just driving so many different things in this field. A little bit more about the details of ICF. This is the size of that capsule. So there's this kind of gold tin, uh, gold cup, I guess is what you would say. And lasers irradiate, they shine through here at an angle and they irradiate the edges of that gold, which creates an X-ray bath, which is extremely hot. So it heats up this capsule in the middle, um, which kind of drives off the outside layer, but then that creates an equal and opposite reaction that drives in the inside layer, um, compressing it to about half the width of a human hair. Um, this is the capsule here before it has been compressed. So it starts off extremely small. And yeah, there's just a lot of interesting physics going on here, including the fact that the outside of this capsule is diamond. Um, which is just helpful for kind of inertially confining this fuel. And the actual fuel on the inside is isotopes of, isotopes of hydrogen, um, so deuterium and tritium, which is good for fusion reactions. So um, there are people doing this, but there's a lot of people doing kind of basic science and engineering to help make these implosions even better. So how do we get these implosions to be such high pressures? We use laser facilities. So there's kind of two big ones here in the US. There's Omega, which is in Rochester, New York. Um, and it's kind of like the test facility. You kind of test your technologies there. It's smaller in terms of the amount of energy that you can get, but still gets you to those extremely high pressures. And then the one where they actually got those fusion experiments and ignition to happen is at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, it's the largest and most energetic laser facility in the world. It um, operates at 500 terawatts, which during the experiment is consuming a thousand times more power than the USA uses at any instant in time. But the experiments on extremely short time scales, so, um, so you're not actually consuming, well, you're consuming a lot of power, but not you know, too much power. And then um, to the actual target, once the laser kind of gets amplified and stuff, it goes through quite a bit of losses, and so you get two megajoules of energy onto the target. But these experiments are extremely expensive, if you can think about all the energy that's used for that 500 terawatt um, draw from the grid. So on Omega, you can get about 1,200 experiments done each year, and they have an annual budget of $86 million per year. And so Omega is the laser that I'll be presenting stuff on, and for um, kind of an example, we operate... Um, maybe one set of experiments a year. And like during an experiment day, we might get 12 shots. So 12 different times we get to hit the laser on an experimental target. And that shot day is probably about $75,000. But of course, grants cover it. But um, it's something that you can't just say, oh, let's quickly run another experiment. There's a lot of thought that has to be done beforehand. Um, and then on the right here, I'm showing what some of the diagnostics in this regime looks like. So you can't just stick a probe and tell me what the pressure is in these systems. Um, because they're so hot, it will just ionize your probe and become a plasma. So we use a variety of things, but oftentimes the pictures are very blurry, very fuzzy, and it's just kind of difficult to understand your diagnostics. So this regime is really heavily reliant on simulations, um, both for designing your experiments and for interpreting your results after you've done experiments. And that's kind of my area of focus. Okay, just a little bit more about inertial confinement fusion and how challenging this is and why it's really driven a lot of uh, ex exploration in this field. So this is a figure of one of the small little targets, and you can barely even see, but the red circles are circling defects in that target. And the defect to capsule radius um, is about equivalent of the same radius of the Hotel Alex Johnson to the radius of the Earth. So extremely small defects, but even though they're so small, they make it very difficult to compress the fuel without getting mixing into the system. And you don't want that because if you have mixing jetting down into your hot fuel, it'll cool off the fuel and impede ignition. And this is has been studied as one of the things that impedes ignition the most. Um, and just another kind of fun statistic, it's roughly the equivalent of trying to compress a basketball down to a ping pong ball while keeping that spherical symmetry. So very difficult. And so these kind of mixing mechanisms are something that's been highly studied and that we're going to draw off of for my work. So a little bit of background on these making, mix, mixing mechanisms that are studied in classical fluid dynamics all the way up to these high energy density regimes. 
The first is kind of the most well known, I'd say it's the Rayleigh Taylor instability. And that's when you have a heavy fluid sitting on top of a light fluid. And if there's any bit of perturbation between the interface of those fluids, they are going to be unstable and the heavy fluid will start to fall, the light fluid will start to rise. And so it's really just an instability due to um, mixed mass, mix matched density and pressure gradients. And so this is just a short video of an experiment that mostly just to show kind of how this looks. So that is a lighter fluid on the bottom, heavy fluid on the top. You get these bubbles that are rising. And this is similar to what's actually happening in one of those ICF capsules. And then as a last example, this is something you actually see every day because that creamer on the top is heavier than the water-based coffee on the bottom and kind of that sinking is due to the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So heavily studied in both classical, but then also in this um, more high energy regime. Now, an extension of that instability that you see possibly every day with your coffee is one that you probably don't see um, ever. So it's called the rickmeyer meshkov instability, but it's essentially just a um, in the limit of the gravity of that Rayleigh-Taylor instability becoming instantaneous. And so that would be a shock wave. So now if you shock a perturbed interface shown here, um, you also have mismatched density and pressure gradients. And that deposits vorticity along this interface, and you can kind of imagine it curling up. And so there are some experiments here that shows how that little bit of a perturbation, once it's been shocked, can really grow and curl up. And so, like I said, there's a lot of theory that's kind of been done already to understand these instabilities. All right, so my work um, has focused on kind of studying these hydrodynamic instabilities in the high energy density regime. Um, and I focus on the simulations, but I work with a lot of people to design the experiments as well. And so um, today, almost we'd be talking about this modeling of the rickmeyer meshkov instability to, to study material viscosity at these high pressures. But I also wanted to point out um, just some other cool things that I have done and can be done in this regime, such as at much higher temperatures and pressures, more in that ICF regime, uh, I've studied that Rayleigh-Taylor instability and looked at how radiation in the system, because it's so hot, it actually affects the flow. So that's interesting. And then another thing that I've worked on is measuring the sound speed in diamond, um, which is that outside layer of those ICF capsules. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, diamond, it sounds pretty wild, but we have very small samples of, of micro, microns. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we can determine some material properties that way, but we'll stick with this one mostly for today. Okay. So now I'll talk a little bit about planetary interiors, which is also relevant to this work. So um, there are such things called super Earths, which are essentially planets that have been found that are within about one to 10 times the mass of Earth, and they fall kind of here in this plot. So I've talked about ignition. Now we're about at lower temperatures, but, um, but lower temperatures, lower pressures, still in the high energy density regime, and kind of the work that we're doing is hopefully going to eventually be applied up to those higher pressures and temperatures. So I'll talk a little bit about super Earths. Um, there's essentially many of them that have been found by telescopes such as Kepler, and they're mostly of interest as potential habitable planets learning about possible habitable places. Um, and so we can kind of assume their composition based off of uh, things that astronomers do to know their relative radius and their mass. So here is a graph of like Earth mass and radius. And you can see in the center here, there's a line of kind of constant composition, Earth-like composition. And so when one of those super Earths fall on that, we can make assumptions about the composition of that planet. So things like um, what materials make up the mantle and stuff like that. The thing that differs super Earths from Earth is that because they are larger, they can have quite a bit higher pressures in their mantle. So here is just a simple schematic of super Earth that's seven times the mass of Earth. Um, and you can see it kind of in the lower mantle, you can get up to a terapascal of pressure, where in the Earth you'd have like 100 gigapascals of pressure. So, um, but, so we're, we're going to be probing this higher pressure regime, but we're going to make conclusions such as, you know, thinking that these terrestrial planets probably have similar makeups in their mantles, such as quartz and oxides, which we know is in the Earth's mantle. And so studying the um, 
the dynamics of these mantles is quite a difficult task, um, especially because there is very difficult to measure the material properties of these materials at these high pressures and temperatures. And the dynamics of the mantle can affect things like plate tectonics. So here I'm kind of showing this thing called slab subduction. So it gets pulled into the mantle um, and the fluid dynamics of the mantle is what's causing that. And then even things like magnetic field generation, which is a coupling of fluid mechanics and, and magnetism, but um, that's all affected by, by uh, processes happening, dynamic processes happening in the mantle. So um, our work here that I'll be showing is we want to study the viscosity of magnesium oxide, which is a mantle building block material. Um, it's never been measured experimentally at these relevant pressures. And so this lack of constraint on this viscosity within many orders of magnitude, I'm talking one pascal second to a couple hundred thousand pascal seconds, um, this it being used in different planetary models really creates uncertainty in these planetary models. And so our goal is to constrain the viscosity of magnesium oxide to within an order of magnitude at these relevant pressures, um, with this initial kind of motivating thing being the super Earths, but you can kind of see easily how if we get to higher, higher pressures, it could be helpful for people doing ICF experiments with different materials and stuff like that as well. Okay, now I'll go into a bit more background on the viscous rickmeyer meshkov instability and our target design. So how do we actually want to use hydrodynamic instabilities to measure viscosity? Well, we're kind of drawing on some previous work. So previous studies have used hydro instabilities to constrain material properties. There's something called a corrugated shock, which essentially is like a sine wave within a shock wave. Um, and its behavior is dependent on viscosity and it's been used using like a flyer plate hitting um, a sample really hard to determine the viscosity of metals. Then using the laser at the National Ignition Facility, some people have studied the Rayleigh-Taylor instability and how it evolves with time and we're able to measure metal strengths. And now we're using the Rickmar Meshkov instability to measure the viscosity of magnesium oxide. So a little bit more detail of how we create these high pressure conditions in our experiments. We use the Omega laser in Rochester, New York. Um, the inside of that is shown in here. And just to remind you that we're operating with very small targets, even though the inside of this chamber is huge. Um, Omega has already been used to probe the equation of state of magnesium oxide up to 2300 GPA. And we're aiming for about hundreds of GPA. So it's definitely well suited for our work. And these experiments are very interesting. They happen on short time scales. So the longest experiment you can have is 40 nanoseconds. Um, and then they also operate with extremely small targets. So the biggest your experimental target might be is on the order of a millimeter or a couple millimeters. And so the way that we can get this to that high pressure is the omega lasers shine upon some sort of ablator material, which means a material that will heat up extremely fast increase the pressure extremely quickly, and that increase in pressure causes blow off off the back of it. And then we call it a rocket-like effect. That blow off is going to create a shock wave ascending through the sample. And then we can kind of choose from a range of diagnostics that are available at these facilities already. So um, for our specific design, it kind of made sense to choose a diagnostic called Visar, which is um, essentially an inter interferometer system, but I'll try to explain it simply, it doesn't matter too much. Essentially, we can get time resolved velocity measurements of any reflective surface with this diagnostic. So here I've shown um, kind of an example of what this might look like if you just had a flat reflective interface here and you shocked it and you were looking through the sample with Visar. You get, this is what the raw Visar data looks like. Um, the fringes are an interference pattern, but essentially changes in those fringes when they move, when they jump, are directly proportional to the velocity of that reflective surface. So this little point here, when those fringes jump, uh, correspond to when that interface has been shocked. And when an interface is shocked, the velocity of the interface will increase. Um, so this is kind of a simple example of that. So essentially, we can get velocity of an interface with this method. So that's something to think about. Okay, now to a little bit of math, sorry, uh, <laughs> but I'll try to make it quick. Um, so we have to look towards Richmar-Meshkov theory to 
design these targets and make sure once we do simulations, our simulations are kind of consistent with the known theory. So essentially, the Rickmer Meshkov instability, once again, we have an incident shock, an interface with a amplitude and a wavelength. That shock will travel, travel through the interface. The shock is now down here. And you have a different density in each material once it's been shocked because it's been compressed. And so um, there's kind of some known theory that I've just kind of thrown up here. But mostly I want to say um, that these sorts of instabilities are dependent on the acceleration field, this G, K, which is the um, wave number, so like the wavelength. A here, which is the Atwood number, which I'll be talking about a bit. So the Atwood number is just a non-dimensional description of the density difference between the two materials. And then this small a, a naught is just the um, initial amplitude. So for Kamar Meshkov, because it's a shock, we can model that acceleration as instantaneous. And then you get this um, pretty simple equation for the growth rate, just a constant growth rate of that amplitude with time. Um, so there's a couple of things that are a bit more complicated, though, which I'll start to show with my simulations. But Richtmeier, who did this analysis initially, um, noticed that he needed to account for compressibility. So because uh, you are shocking the system and the densities are changing, he proposed to account for compressibility using the post-shock values of density. And there's been kind of some work that show that that doesn't fit in all cases. And so another case that I will highlight is this correction, which I just kind of call the average outward number case. So you're taking an average of the post-shock density outward numbers and pre-shock and averaging them together. And that works in cases where you're maybe not having um, compressing something that's like an ideal gas at very high uh, Mach numbers. You're compressing something at maybe lower Mach numbers, so it's not as compressible. It's just, it's kind of an art, unfortunately, still. But that's a little bit of background that I will reference. And then lastly, that was all for the inviscid case. To get the viscous case, um, it's essentially, when you look at it, this growth rate of the amplitude is this term, which is essentially just the growth rate of the inviscid case, multiplied by a decaying exponential that's dependent on the viscosity here. So with those equations, we can kind of start to design these targets. How can we? Um, look for different values such that we can determine the viscosity of these materials. So on the left, I'm showing that perturbation amplitude with time. So it's just a linear growth if you are inviscid, and as you increase the viscosity, it grows less. And then on the right, I'm showing that growth rate. And so this is really what we want to use when we are designing these targets. Um, so we can measure the growth rate by that visor looking at a reflective interface. And so when we design the amplitude, the wavelength um, of these packages, we want to be able to differentiate between an order of magnitude value of viscosity. That's what we kind of set out to do. So just a kind of sample um, signal to noise ratio of the visor, if we put that on here, you can see in this design within this experimental time frame, you'd be able to differentiate between these values of viscosity. And then um, as a counterexample, if we increase the wavelength of our package, which might be helpful for some other kind of um, reasons. But if we actually look at this final result, we wouldn't be able to differentiate between an inviscid fluid and a fluid up to about you know, 500 pascal seconds. So there's a bit of design work that went into this. Um, and obviously, we settled on one where we thought we could differentiate between values of viscosity within many different orders of magnitude, because we really didn't know where we were going to fall in this 100 to 100,000 Pascal second regime. Um, so this is kind of the final design of our target. On the left is the actual laser pulse that we use on Omega EP. So it's four laser beams stitched together. Um, and then on the right here is our target. So we have an epoxy ablation layer. That's a layer that's going to help us send a shock wave through the sample. Our interface is a single mode sinusoid perturbed on the interface. Um, and it has a reflective aluminum layer on it, so we can look at it with our visor. And then the sample that we actually care about is here, the transparent magnesium oxide. Okay, so now I'll be moving on to um, kind of the simulation work that goes alongside these experiments. So um, we use an in-house Eulerian hydrodynamics code. So essentially, it's simulating the full Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and it just has, with a caveat here, that we use a five-equation compressible multiphase model. 
that just means that we're able to capture multiple materials at once. So materials with different um, equations of state and stuff like that. So as I've shown here, I can initialize both the epoxy and the magnesium oxide. We use something called a stiffened equation of state, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then of course, their viscous simulations. Uh, for the numerical method, right now we're using finite volume um, and then just a RK3 scheme for time integration. And then this code that we have in our lab is very nice because these simulations would take many, many weeks if we did not have something called adaptive mesh refinement. And so that is what I'm showing here where the mesh of our CFD simulation uh, is controlled and we can control it about features that we're interested in. So I can refine the size of the cells along the shock wave and along the interface and maybe along points where there's kind of vortices in the flow. But otherwise, if there's not much happening in the flow, it can be a much bigger cell and that makes it so our simulations don't take as long, which is helpful. Okay, so um, a little bit about the equation of state that I mentioned, the stiffened equation of state. Um, in this regime, material is not behaving like an ideal gas. It's probably most closely actually to something that's like a plastically deforming solid in this kind of warm, dense matter regime. And so if we were to try to model it like an ideal gas for the shock pressures that we're getting, it just wouldn't match the behavior at all. So thankfully there's some stuff in the literature about these materials that we can draw on to get a representative equation of state. So what I'm showing here is what we call USUP relationships, or essentially a relationship between the shock velocity and the velocity behind a shock wave in the materials of interest. So MGO in the center and epoxy on the right hand side. And it's been kind of formulated for quite a while now that this is a linear relationship or at least approximating it as a linear relationship is a good thing. And so um, if I can get this USUP relationship, which I have my materials, that will be quite helpful. And so now I apply that USUP relationship and help formulate something called the stiffened equation of state. This is an equation of state that's often used in modeling of like liquids that are undergoing, that have cavitation in them. So you have to care about compressible effects um, rather than just an incompressible liquid fluid. Um, and so essentially, this is kind of how you write it out, but the way I like to think about it is in terms of the sound speed. So here C squared is the sound speed squared. For an ideal gas, that would just be gamma P over rho. But for um, our case, we have this additional parameter P infinity. And so essentially for a given pressure, you are going to have a higher um, sound speed in the system. So that's more representative of things that are becoming more and more like a solid or less and less uh, compressible. And so without going into too much of the details, using this USUP relationship and what's called the shock jump conditions. So the conditions uh, governing how like the density, the energy and the pressure changes across the shock. We can combine those things and get these equations for gamma and P infinity, and then do a little bit more legwork to finally get, um, and, and sorry, so gamma and P infinity here are now only going to depend on the shock speed in each material. And so then we do a little bit more legwork to determine what that shock speed should be in each material for a determined kind of final pressure that we want to be at. And we can get gamma and P infinity for each material. So down here on the left, we have um, that result for epoxy, where the blue line is that empirical linear fit that uh, is kind of in the literature. And then the orange line is this stiffened equation of state. So we match it exactly to the expected shock speed that we see in the system, and then it deviates slightly from there. And then this figure just shows how we kind of have to do this process for um, different values of shock speeds, but it's easy for us to do now. Okay, so finally here is um, an inviscid simulation of the epoxy MGO interface at 100 gigapascals, just to kind of see it in video format. So here the interface is staying in the center, and then there's a transmitted shock going through the MGO and a reflected shock going through the epoxy here. Um, and so first we kind of start looking at how this interface evolves in an inviscid sense, just because as you add on more and more physics, it's kind of hard to detangle things. So I'll show some inviscid simulation results initially. And it really highlights just this kind of weird regime of small length scales and small time scales that we're on. So this is the initial inviscid simulation. So I'll kind of walk us through it. So first thing that we saw that isn't given to you from the Richtmeier's model 
is that there's going to be a compression of your initial interface. Um, and that's due to kind of the mismatch between the velocity behind the shock wave and the velocity of the shock wave. And in this case, it's a significant amount of compression. Then something that also is not given to you right away and is very, um, stands out on this time scale is this regime here where you kind of have a different uh, slope than you do in later time. And that's because it actually takes time for this instability to develop and grow, um, which is not something that we realized going into it. And you know, a lot of people have done Rick Meyer Meshkov simulations and stuff for a long time, but they're usually doing it um, for an ideal gas. And this time scale is very, very small, so you barely see it. But we saw it here. And um, this is just kind of showing that the interface is staying in the center here. And as these shocks go away, you'll see that there's some waves traveling perpendicular to the shocks. And those waves and the amount of time it takes them to kind of reach the interface is essentially what's uh, responsible for that startup time. But learning about that startup time is really important for designing these experiments, because imagine if you designed it, your experiment to only last up until about 15 nanoseconds, you wouldn't capture any of that behavior of the growth of Brinkmeyer Meshkov that you actually wanted to see. Um, and then uh, lastly, in the late time regime, this is where I was talked about those different Atwood numbers, the average and the post shock. We are uh, matching much more the slope of this average Atwood number compared to the post shock. So when designing um, for our experiments, that is something that became very important. So um, just to kind of wrap up what we found out in these inviscid simulations, I'm showing this now in velocity space. So I just showed amplitude versus time. This is the amplitude velocity with time. Um, this is kind of what our predictions would look like with theory, where theory is in red, um, and then the black is the simulations, and this is inviscid, and the dashed is viscid. Uh, so this is how we'd be kind of predicting how our experiments behaved if we didn't know about these things beforehand, if we were just using the theory. But now that we know we need to use the average APWA number and account for the startup time, we're able to um, understand the theory and match the theory quite well to our simulations uh, when we go about designing these things. Okay. So the last thing uh, that I want to talk about that kind of involves these inviscid simulations is something that we looked at from one of our shot data, experimental data. Once again, here's the raw visor. And we saw this feature where, OK, our interface has been shocked. It increases in velocity. That is expected. That's good. But then around 25 nanoseconds or so, we have this big bump here. And at first, we were not super sure what that was. was. But we realized when we looked at our laser drive, um, in this specific case, the laser shuts off at 20 nanoseconds. And when that laser shuts off, there's no back pressure at the end of the target anymore. And so it drops to essentially vacuum pressure, which causes what's called a rarefaction wave to race towards the interface. So decreasing the velocity, decreasing the pressure, decreasing the density. And those decreases um, probably lead to that bump. So I'll kind of show us exploring that in the simulations. Um, so here are the simulations where on the left is our initial condition. So here is the, in the density space, is the material interface and the shock wave um, about to hit that interface. And then there's this rarefying uh, wave that we set up a bit further back so that we can look at the effect of what happens when that rarefying wave hits the interface. And that's shown here, where in red is just a shock simulation. You just get that linear growth with time. But then if we have that shock and that rarefaction, we actually get a bit more growth. So um, this is the point of time when the rarefaction hits the interface. And this is kind of the experimental time window, and so we believe that that bump in the data is due to this rarefaction wave. So that was helpful and important for us to know that we need to include that in our simulations to correctly model this instability. We can't just set up like a simple shock wave. So now I'll move on to kind of our final simulation and experimental results, which I think are exciting. Hopefully I can convince you that. Um, so our final simulations, instead of just having this simple shock wave right next to the interface, um, we now use data from another code that I won't go into too much detail about, but essentially it's a plasma code. So it can, a plasma code with a laser package, so it can model the interactions of a laser with a surface um, and convert those laser interactions into pressure and density. So I can use that as like an initial, or a boundary condition on my flow field. 
um, to capture kind of these unsteady effects of the laser. And so doing that, um, now we can look at our final experimental results. So here is the target that we see with a couple of wavelengths of um, our perturbation. And then this is the raw visor data where this window specifically shows two valleys and one peak. You can kind of see that curvature here. This is uh, where right when the shock hits the interface. And um, as I said before, the wiggles in that data just correspond to uh, particle velocity, the velocity of that interface. So we can obtain that from our um, experimental data now, which is exciting. And so all I need to do now is subtract the peak from the valley, and that gives us that amplitude growth rate with time. So that's what I'm showing here on the left, is that amplitude growth rate with time with some error bars for the visor. And then I've integrated that experimental data on the right so that it's just a little bit easier maybe to think in amplitude space for some people. So we see the similar features that we saw in those simulations. Um, here we have that compression period during the shock traversal. Then we have this period of the startup time where we haven't reached our kind of final value of, um, of growth rate yet. And then we have this period where we get a large growth in, um, in, in the velocity, and that's due to both the rarefaction wave hitting it, and when that rarefaction wave hits it, it stretches the material and causes an increase in velocity, but we're also still getting growth due to the brickmeyer meshkov instability there. So now we can start overlaying the, the simulations on top of the experiments. This is just an inviscid simulation, um, but I do want to point out that kind of matching this well is quite important um, for letting us know that we're matching the equation of state quite well. Um, so that's nice. <laughs> and then I can add on some viscous simulations. So here I'm adding on 500, 1,000, and 5,000 Pascal seconds. And here you can see when we kind of zoom into this region where we're getting that growth, we can bound our experiments within bounds of the different values of viscosity. And so we set out to bound it to within about an order of magnitude. And at the moment, that seems to be what we're doing here, bounding it between 500 and 5,000 Pascal seconds. So um, we're quite excited about this result. It really hasn't been done in this regime before. And then lastly, that was just for one experimental shot, so one target, one hit of the laser. Um, we have a second set of experiments that we can look at as well. They're at the same pressure, same amplitude, same wavelength, but there's just a little bit of details about the length of the epoxy ablation layer that makes the rarefaction wave arrive a bit later. So we have to simulate them differently. So those are included in this plot. This is once again the inviscid simulation. Um, we add on some values, and once again, we're starting to bound it. Um, there's still a little bit of work that needs to be done, but we're quite excited about this result. And so the last thing I'll talk about is kind of our current work, which hopefully ties back to mechanics engineering a little bit, where we figured out we need to do some constitutive modeling of some strain rate dependent behavior of this viscosity. So, um, why we think we have to do that is if we look at this left figure here, as we start increasing the values of viscosity, um, we aren't capturing the experimental behavior of this well quite as much. We're having less compression, and then there also takes some time for, for this to form, whereas in the experiment, it's just a very sharp well. Um, so you can see that there. And if we look at an inviscid simulation versus a very viscous simulation, there's a rise time associated with this shock. So this is like if you're sitting in the sample and you're looking at your pressure versus time, uh, this is what it would look like. And for inviscid, you get shocked to high pressure very quick, but it takes more time with the viscous simulation, which is expected um, if you had a very viscous shock front. But it looks like, according to the experimental data, that we do not. So um, some of my collaborators kind of pointed me to a paper, essentially, that um, looks at how the strain rate um, is dependent in materials at this kind of uh, plastically deforming solids, uh, but modeling it as a fluid regime. And so essentially, uh, here we have like magnesium oxide. There's something called the fourth power law, where the stress of your due to your shock um, and the strain rate, strain rate have a fourth power law. And you can kind of go about that 
to determine the expected rise time or the expected viscosity at your shock front if you know the strain rate at your shock front. So we can obtain the strain rate at the shock front due to our simulations. And then I kind of implemented this model, which essentially decreases the viscosity right at the shock front to around 50 Pascal seconds uh, for at least this given strain rate. In doing so, these are the results. Um, so I'm just plotting one value of viscosity here, but the red is before I implemented that model. And then the black is with that model implementation. And you can see that we are having that kind of um, sharp feature here rather than this diffuse feature. And same thing if you look with just the pressure versus time. There's a little bit of a rise time, but not so much. So we're quite excited about that. Um, so concluding, um, we designed this campaign to carry out and measure the uh, viscous requirement mesh cloud growth. Uh, we were able to simulate the experiments quite well using our in-house hydro code, the stiffened equation state, and this laser package input. And our simulations are bounding the viscosity to within an order of magnitude. There might be a little bit more work needed, but we, we think we can definitely get there. And then this is an exciting campaign. We really have not measured viscosity in these pressures at all. Um, and so we can extend this campaign to measure values of viscosity in magnesium oxide at different pressures. And then due to some other complications, we can also look at how a shock behaves in these materials if we want to look at more opaque materials. So we're excited to extend that. And with that, that's my talk. I'd be happy to take questions. And thank you guys for listening. Yeah. So one of the major issues with the MI facility was the the instabilities, mm -hmm. uh, the, the laser hits the pellet, multiple lasers hit the pellet. Uh, that was the major thing. Yeah. So when it's, uh, now it's working, uh, mm -hmm. they showed us it's, uh, on, on all those issues with the instabilities. Yeah, so or? instabilities are definitely still the main degradation issue, and they still are seeing it um, occurring in these shots where they've gotten ignition. But a couple of things have made it so that they've been able to get ignition. One is that they're able to machine those diamond capsules uh, a bit more precisely. So in uh, 2021, they had a shot that was uh, not yet ignition, but I think burning plasma. And that was their best like machined capsule without defects and stuff like that. So they learned that they need to make sure their capsules are machined much better. So that's one thing. Um, they've also decreased, there's a fill tube that they use to get the gas inside of there. They decreased the diameter of that and that helped. Um, and then the last thing is they increased the laser energy on NIF, which um, just hitting it harder was helpful. Yeah. And the, the laser pulse that you showed, there were four laser pulses, mm -hmm. right? So are, is it the, the same, uh, one in the same way like NIF is using it, or is it different? Yeah, so NIF lasers are a bit more different. So Omega, which is the laser facility that we use, is kind of a smaller facility. It has four beams, and so we can stitch those four beams together and create a long pulse, because that's kind of what we want for these experiments. Um, on NIF, I think the pulse is maybe at most 10 nanoseconds, but they have 192 laser beams. And they have it shaped such that there's kind of like a ramp compression, and then a shock, and then another shock, just um, in their design process. One last question on this, uh, the laser. So mm -hmm. we had this very typical the profile. It was neither flat uh, yeah. or pad or neither Gaussian. So was this specific? For that. Yeah, well, we would like it to be like kind of top hat, and so that's kind of the best that they can do uh, is we kind of more got that ramp up, and so that's why we need to incorporate the laser into our simulations rather than just assuming like a constant pressure drive because, yeah, that's the best that the laser can do, and it varies from shot day to shot day. Are you modeling any heat transfer energy and phase change? Yeah, so, not really? so no, we aren't. So it's just essentially a fluid simulation. Um, a fluid simulation where we define the equation state, and that's helpful. Uh, heat transport, we aren't modeling. In this regime, it doesn't seem to be necessary. As you get into those higher kind of plasma states, um, it's, you often mo or model or actually solve like electron heat, um, conductivity uh, as you get into higher higher temperatures and you actually start to get ionizing plasmas it gets a bit more complicated you can do um, what's called pick which is particle and cell if you expect there to be kind of like magnetic fields or um, stuff that i've worked on previously treats um, 
electron temperature and ion temperature separately. So you can get more and more complex, but it seems like this regime that we're in, which is only 2,000 Kelvin, you don't really need that. Yeah, so yeah, we I try to resolve all of that with the AMR. So it's not something that I'm like looking at and of interest, but of course I want it to be resolved such that we're getting accurate results. Um, so I don't know if I have a great simulation showing that, but I'll try to see if maybe um, this one is actually not as resolved as I would like. It was before we had the AMR instituted, but uh, you can see that the reflected shock here actually takes on a perturbed shape as well, as well as the transmitted shock. And then if I were to kind of increase the, um, or decrease the bounds on this gradient of density profile, you'd see these transverse waves that occur in here that are due to that non-planar interface interaction. Yeah, I guess maybe, yeah, so like this, um, this one shows where I've kind of turned up so that you can really see these smaller waves. Um, yeah, so there's kind of these transverse waves here that, um, that occur until the shock waves are about a wavelength away and they don't really matter as much. Interface, right? See, what are you, how are you modeling the interface? Yeah, so um, here the interface, so our code uses shock capturing and interface capturing, which I'm not on the code development side, I'm more on the code user side, but essentially it uses method of characteristics to kind of uh, predict where, where things should be. <laughs> yeah. But, um, Someone in our group is actually starting to implement a phase field approach, which kind of keeps the interface to be a certain thickness the whole time, but I haven't used that yet. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for the talk. Yeah. Obviously very passionate, so it was a lot of fun to listen to. Um, can, I, I think I missed something about the interface. Okay. You said the interface is aluminum? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have to put aluminum on the interface for, uh, let's see if I Okay, yeah, so that, so we machine an interface. I guess something that maybe I take for granted is that these targets start off as solids, and then, um, so it's easy to machine an exact wavelength and amplitude. So we machine the epoxy and the MGO, and we essentially put them together, but both of those things are not reflective, so there's no way to really look at it with that diagnostic that sees reflective surfaces. So we put a very thin layer of aluminum there that is reflective. Um, and we don't actually model that aluminum layer in the simulations, which is something we could do in the future. But it's kind of thought to be uh, traveling with the interface in this regime. Okay. And is the, like, so it starts out solid. Yes. But obviously under these. Yeah. It, it's, it's not going to be solid after. It's what we would refer to as kind of a plastically deforming solid regime. Okay. Um, so it's more solid than a lot of other experiments in this, in this regime. Um, and, and I'd say, yeah, it's essentially plastically deforming, but kind of under the guise that if you hit something hard enough, it acts like a fluid. Sure. Um, so that's where we are with this. And then in those like higher pressure, higher temperature experiments, the ICF experiments, they essentially ionize right away and become a plasma and like a fluid. So, but we aren't at those pressures or temperatures. So the sinusoidal interface, mm -hmm. and I guess this really kind of, maybe this already answered my question, is this is a, like, when it starts off with, this is a solid machine. Yes. Sinusoidal yeah. Device. Yeah. It's machined. Um, we have a guy that says some weird laser manufacturing process to machine it to these very precise uh, microns, like amplitude and stuff. And so it's just a, a physical, very small little thing that uh, gets in there that's solid. Can you show one of your visor? Yeah. Let me. Okay. So. Time is obviously horizontal scale. Mm -hmm. You have position, which yep. is the literal like equilibrium position along the interface. Yes. Just the y scale. What is the what is the color? Yeah, that? so the, they're kind of they take a while to wrap your head around. So the fringes is an interference pattern from essentially a light source that is reflecting off of this uh, interface, and the changes in those fringes is uh, due to Doppler shift. So um, 
so that's essentially what it is. And so like right here, these changes in these fringes correspond to the velocity of the thing that we're sampling, which is right here. And then you know, as you go up it, that's essentially what it is. And that's and so we do a bit of analysis and getting the, the change of those fringes since it's related to the Doppler shift of this moving surface, you can get the particle velocity or the velocity of that interface out of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it took me quite a while to wrap my head around that as well. Um, and then I guess I have a question. For like maybe this is uh, maybe this is not like very related to your work. Mm -hmm. But um, can you explain maybe a, a little bit clearer what is meant by that? Oh, finally we got more energy out of this ignition. Because yeah. They're putting so much energy in. Yeah. That the statement seems so. Like misleading. What, yeah. what, does that really, what does that really mean? Yeah, so at current the current state is that they are providing, let's see, so the December 2022 shot, they provided 2.05 megajoules of laser energy into this HOLROM um, regime. This has what this like can is called. It's called a HOLROM. And so there's a lot more energy that they had to do beforehand to excite these lasers and get them to be of such high intensity. And so it's not like engineering break even there, but the energy that's going into this capsule, then when that fusion um, implodes, you have a runaway effect of essentially like neutrons and you're fusing. This is what the sun does, um, hydrogen, hydrogen fusion. And so when you fuse hydrogen with hydrogen, you're going to get energy out rather than, and, and less mass than you had initially. Um, so it's, it's Einstein's turning mass into energy, essentially. So because they put a lot of energy into it, they're able to get it to implode, they're able to get it to be very hot, and now they're losing mass and gaining energy and getting energy out of the system more than they put into this scientific target, is kind of how they describe it. Does that make some sense? Okay, yeah, I, it's something that maybe I've thought about for quite a while, so I um, could explain it a bit better, maybe. Is this better, or either, either is better, or this one is better? Uh, I mean, if you're at an ICF conference, they'll tell you this is better. If you're at a magnetic conference, they'll tell you it's better. This is the first one to show ignition. Um, I, ITER is better designed to become a power plant, but there are lots of private companies now doing starting up ignition um, power plant ideas because we show an ignition with it. So you mentioned on the that it was 10 nanoseconds was the longest pulse, and uh, they increased the energy to get the ignition. Have they looked into actually decreasing the time scale in the femtosecond to try to get the ignition? Um, I'm sure somebody has thought about that. There's definitely people that talk about femtosecond lasers. I'm just not exactly <coughs> sure how the energy balance comes out. So it seems to me that if that was a good like or a suitable idea, they would have done it. But I know also to get ignition, they've actually had to increase the size of this fuel pellet. So I assume that means you actually need more like laser energy there and more time. Uh, it's kind of a delicate balance, but people would be happy to keep thinking about these things. They're definitely still designing it more. Mm -hmm. In terms of the getting the response of the magnesium oxide mm -hmm. and kind of characterizing that, does that help with like, is the application of that then looking at like planetary history or those like modeling those uh, yeah. super Earths? Yeah, there's kind of two applications, and this field uh, kind of always has a planetary slash uh, stellar component and then back to ICF component. So, yes, initially it's pretty much being able to say we benchmark this value of viscosity, and you can use that in your modeling codes now, and that helps them better model things over you know very long time scales of things like. Plate tectonics, which helps uh, some people model that so that they can kind of learn about the outgassing of these super Earths, which informs about the atmosphere. It's a you know, kind of lots of different drivers there. But then also, um, like magnesium oxide can be used in experiments that um, a lot of experiments go into ICF that aren't just trying to do the fuel in, fuel out. And it has some nice properties that they kind of back it up against other things sometimes. So. We can also tell them this is the value of viscosity of this, and that helps your design process. Could you share a couple of comments about 
the your numerical experiments and the platforms running it on. Yeah. The HPC cluster. Yes. And the size of the mesh and that kind of stuff. Definitely. Yeah. So um, so right now we're running it um, thanks to the NSF Access program. Right now we're running it on Purdue Anvil's uh, cluster, and the mesh size is uh, well the base mesh is 30 or 64 cells per uh, per wavelength and then we're using three levels of refinement for AMR so that means uh, like for each level it's a factor of two uh, increased for the AMR and we've done resolution studies with this and then in terms of running it on the clusters it's actually quite computationally expensive because of the high values of viscosity so um, so there's something called a CFL number which is often how you limit your time step, but because of the viscosity, we're actually limited by the von Neumann number, which instead of um, your time step decreasing by one over delta x, it's delta x squared. So it just is a lot more restrictive in terms of the time stepping. So like the very high simulations on these CPUs take um, like up to five days on 700 cores to run. But we're working on getting them onto GPUs, which hopefully will de de decrease that by about 50 um, in order to get to 50. Yeah. Anybody want to take a question? More time, you see more questions. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so I just had, I was curious and kind of need to see like the invisible code did a pretty good job qualitatively. Of matching the experiments, per se? Yeah, so I, I mean. Know, can, can you comment on the fact that invisible code is due to viscosity and then you're trying to model a material that is very highly viscous as opposed to a solid? Yeah. And so I still, so what's the physics is capturing or not capturing? Yeah, so I guess we don't really expect viscosity to uh, begin affecting the system until the Rickmar mesh problem instability starts to really develop, which is in this later time. Um, and so maybe I should do it here in like one of the zoomed in images. So if we kind of zoom in, it's clear that the inviscid is not uh, affecting it uh, or is not matching our, what we see very well here and that the viscous is. But in this early time, especially once we kind of thought about the strain rate dependency of viscosity at a shock front, um, it makes sense that we uh, should match with the inviscid quite well because um, so like 50 pascal seconds, which is what I've now prescribed as the viscosity at the shock front, is um, not a lot in terms of the relative like magnitude of 5,000 pascal seconds. It doesn't really affect the flow at all. Um, and for, I guess, comparison, I should say the viscosity of water is 1 times 10 to the negative 3 pascal seconds. So it's still very viscous, but it doesn't matter with the pressures that we're at. Well, I mean, as long as we're on this yeah, slide, definitely. how many experiments is this the blue data? Yeah, so this blue data is just one experiment, but we can get like standard deviation because we have multiple peaks and valleys. And so that's one of the issues with these uh, experiments is we get, well, we've had two shot days so far, and that's been over the course of three years. And each shot day you get about between six to 12 shots, depending on if things break or not. And we were also kind of trying out a different campaign that didn't work as well. so we got maybe three shots of this in each one, and one of the visors broke partway through. So this is one, and then this encompasses two shots uh, here, So and with multiple peaks and valleys in each shot. Hold on, you got a standard deviation of one experiment? Yeah, so between the peaks and valleys of each in, in it, um, between multiple peaks and valley within, which in, within one experiment, this so is like a standard the deviation. The machine peaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's see. If I go back. So if you look here, like in our visor images, uh, you can get multiple peaks and valleys in one shot. And so yeah, there's a lot of. It's a hard regime because you don't get that many experiments, and you have to uh, try to make results off of that. But actually, having two exper having three total experiments is quite impressive in this regime, actually. It's very weird. Um, but that's why we kind of have these, we have some different size windows that we've looked at as well that include more of them so we can get a standard deviation. <laughs>
And then there's also some error inherently in there in terms of kind of more how this buys our analysis occurs. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys.